Hi, in this video, I'll be dealing with steady state errors. In control system design, usually there are three specifications we often design for. One is the transient response, the other is stability, and the third is steady state error. The transient response refers to how the response of the system behaves over time. So for example, um, if this were the, uh, the plot of the response of the system, if we had a response that looked something of this nature, we call this an underdamped response. Now, this tells us that over time, you will first have an overshoot, then it will come back and finally settle at a certain value. This behavior tells us a transient response. Now, with a transient response, you're often concerned about things like settling time, peak time, rise time, um, percentage overshoot, if there is an overshoot, and how the shape looks. So we might want to design for that because we want it to be, to be as quick as possible, or maybe we don't want it to kind of lag in its response. Um, we, want the, we want to make sure there is an overshoot of not more than so -so percent, or we want to make sure there is no overshoot whatsoever. That's one thing we could design for. Secondly, we could design for stability to make sure that our system is stable and not that when we give a bounded input, we end up with an output that is growing with time. In other words, an unbounded output. This is an unstable system. That generally is a bad thing. We are usually not interested in having an unstable system. So we design for stability. Say we have an unstable system, we try to stabilize it. A typical example, a prime example of that is um, the inverted pendulum. The inverted pendulum experiment is one, or the ball and plate system, ball and beam system. These are examples of things that are inherently unstable, but we design to make them stable. The third specification we often are interested in is steady state error. With steady state error, we are trying to find out when it does settle. So first of all, to study steady state error, we have to assume stability. If there is no stability, there is no issue of steady state error in the sense that if your output is growing with, with time, it does not settle to any specific value. If it does not settle to any specific value, then we can't talk about steady state error. However, once it has settled to a certain value, if it does settle to a certain value, then we can come up with the steady state error and determine what is steady state error. So the steady state error, by definition, um, the steady state error, I'll just call that E. Let me write it in the frequency domain. So E of S, by definition, is defined as your input, that's your reference signal, minus your output signal. So whatever your output signal is, subtract it from your input signal, and you get your steady state error. Now, this is obviously as time heads towards infinity. So maybe I should specify this as time heads towards infinity. That would give us our steady state error. In other words, we're not checking the error at, say, if you take a look at this response you have over here, there's no point in checking the response of the system while it is still in a transient state. When it gets to the steady state where it has now settled to a certain value, then you can check your steady state error. So, if we could, so maybe let's go ahead and at, at, let's take an example and let's take a simple system. Now, for this, um, um, for today, we will mostly consider the unity feedback system. It's usually convenient to just do this. So unity feedback system is a system that looks something of this nature. Well, I should maybe specify and say unity um, negative feedback system. So it's not just that we have feedback, um, unity feedback in this case, but we'll be interested in negative feedback. If our R is our input and our C is our out output, then this is G of S. And G of S stands for the plant. Okay, so the... Um, the transfer function of the plant, we will often represent that as G of S. Let's take a simple scenario where our input to this system is a unit step function. So if our R of S, um, let me write that up here. If my R of S is a unit step function, then my R of S will simply be 1 over S. Let's us also take the case where G is simply a proportional gain. In other words, your output of the plant is simply a gain multiplied by your input, simply a constant multiplied by your input. If that is the case, we can determine our steady state error. So we said E is equal to R minus C. So our steady state, our yeah, steady state error now, well, let's say the, the error, the equation for the error is simply given as R minus C, which is one over S minus, what is C? C, our uh, signal C here, well, okay, so if, if I, I should actually write things out in this diagram. If our error is given as R minus C, R comes in here into this summing junction, C comes in via feedback into this summing junction, that will mean that our error signal is simply E here. 
So if that is the case, then our C will be our G multiplied by the input to G. So C will be equal to GE. So that's 1 over S minus GE. Okay, so that's 1 over S minus GE. Now, let me um, go ahead and write this. So I will ignore what I've written here just for now. We'll come back to this. For now, I just come back to this expression we had over here, E is equal to R over C, R minus C. So if E is equal to R minus C, that means E is equal to R minus G E. Okay, E is equal to what R minus G E. Um, if we have that, then we can take all the E terms to the left-hand side of the equality sign. That gives us E into 1 plus G being equal to R. And that means that our E, we now have an expression for E that is equal to R over 1 plus G. Um, let me write this G better. So we have an equation that works for us. This is an equation for the error. At any point in time, we had error. So we have two equations for the error at present. Error is given as R of S minus C of S, or as which is usually the case, because we have the inputs and we have our plant, then we can represent our error in terms of the input and the plant. And that will simply be R of S divided by one plus G of S. This is the equation for error. Not necessary for steady state error, but it's the equation for error. So I'm now going to use this, this um, equation here, e is equal to r over 1 plus g. I will now plug in these values we have for r and g. Since we're given the r and we're given the g for this particular example. So for this particular example, my r is 1 over s. My g is equal to k, 1 plus k. So this gives us 1 over s over 1 plus k. Now, 1 over s, um, 1 over... So let me let me write let me rewrite this expression. That's one over one plus k. If I uh, multiply this by one over s, writing it in this way because one over one plus k is simply a constant. One over one plus k is a constant. So this is a constant multiplied by one over s. By the time we take the inverse Laplace transform of this, that gives us e of t. The time function of the error is equal to one over one plus k. Let me give myself some more room to write. 1 over 1 plus k multiplied by u of t. Or I'll just leave that as 1 over 1 plus k. Um, at least for times that are greater, and, or greater than or equal to 0. So we see our error function is 1 over 1 plus k. No matter what the time is. So as time heads towards infinity, this remains as a constant. So if our g of s is simply a constant k, then it turns out that our error will always be a constant 1 over 1 plus k. And that is always the case, no matter what the input is. What would be the difference if our g were different? Well, we could just simply plug in the new g into our equation. Let's take a different scenario now. A different scenario where my g is equal to, say, um, a gain multiplied by a differential. In other words, ks. If my g, if my gain, if my g of s is equal to ks, then my steady state error E, remember, E is equal to R over 1 plus G. So E will be equal to R, 1 over S, over 1 plus G, 1 plus KS. Okay, so 1 over S over 1 plus KS. We can go ahead and solve this out. And this will um, ultimately, we could use partial fractions for this. Um, so this is 1 over S into um, SK plus 1. This we got in partial fractions as something over s plus something over sk plus 1. To find the first parameter, we set our s being equal to 0. If we set our s equal to 0, we end up with this being 1, the numerator over there being 1. And on this other end, we set our s to be equal to negative 1 over k. Set our x s to be negative 1 over k and put that into this expression over here. So we end up with um, negative k, I believe that is. So we end up with negative k. Okay, so that is equal to 1 over s plus, if we want to write it, I mean, okay, I'll make that a negative sign. Uh, one, 1 over s minus 1 over s plus 1 over k. Based on this expression, take inverse Laplace transforms. We arrive with the error function which will be equal to inverse Laplace transform of this first term here is simply my u of t. I'll write that as 1 um, minus 
this other expression over here is my exponential function, exponential of minus t over k, I believe that is. So um, this is my error function. Now as time, if we want to find our steady state error, our steady state error is e as time heads towards infinity. I'll just simply write that as, of, as e of infinity. Make our time function um, um, infin infinite. Expo exponential of negative infinity gives us zero. So e, the steady state error will simply be equal to one. So we see in this particular case that no matter what your k is, your um, steady state error is not dependent on k whatsoever. In the first case, when our g was simply equal to k, when your g was simply a gain, your steady state error was dependent on your gain. Whatever your k was, the larger your k, the lower the steady state error. The lower the k, the larger your steady state error, even though the minimum steady state error you would have in that case would be 1 if your k was equal to 0. Minimum steady state error would be 1. After that, and beyond that, it will always um, get larger. It, as in, it just gets... Okay, so as k gets a whole lot... Sorry, what, am I, what, what did I say about that? Um, okay, so the, the, if you wanted your... The, sorry, I'll take that again. Your steady state error. If your k was equal to 0, your steady state error will be 1. And then um, after that, your steady state error will keep on reducing, reducing, reducing as you increase your k. So if you increase your k all the way to a very, very large value, it becomes, then this, your steady state error becomes a whole lot smaller. So you could reduce your steady state error by increasing your gain. In this case, you cannot do anything about your steady state error by adjusting the gain. If your g is equal to ks, then your steady state error will always be 1. So that's for a, a differentiator, you know, it's a differentiator with a gain. Let's look at another case where my g of s is different. Let's say my g of s was equal to, um, say, k over s. In other words, an integrator in this case multiplied by a gain. If that was the case, then we can get our um, steady state error as being equal to, again, remember it is r over 1 plus g. r, we're keeping it as 1 over s. So 1 over s over 1 plus g. G in this case is K over S. If that's the case, let me multiply through by S. We end up with 1 over hmm. S plus K. 1 over S plus K. This is our error function. Take inverse Laplace transforms. We arrive at the time um, function for our error. And this is the simply the exponential of minus T over K. Okay, So simply the exponential of minus T over K. Now, if that's the case, then as time heads towards infinity, e of infinity. Now, it's I should mention that I'm simply writing e infinity to make life a lot easier. Actually, what I should write, okay, let me write things, um, let me be a little pedantic. To find the steady state error, I should find the limit as time heads towards infinity of e of t. Now, in this case, it's exactly the same thing as, as finding e infinity. Um, just simply slotting e infinity in here, e, slotting infinity for t, and you get the answer. So we find our steady state error as zero. So in this case, we see that an integrator with a gain has a steady state error of zero, and in this case, the gain also does not matter. No matter the value of the gain, your steady state error remains as zero. So we can always find the steady state error to any system, any system whatsoever. If it's in the unity feedback form, then um, we can simply find our steady state error by saying e of s is equal to r of s over 1 plus g of s. And really, that's the whole story about, um, about steady state errors. We could ask the question, what if it was not in a unity feedback form? If, it was not, if, we, uh, if our system is not as a unity feedback system? Well, let's take um, a scenario. Let's say we had um, this, again, our, our, at this point, draw a regular form that we're used to a form that we're typically always used to. And this is where you have G and we have H in the feedback. So let's draw a feedback element here. H is in our feedback. If we have a system like this, can we make this a unity feedback system? Well, the answer is yes. This system we have over here is perfectly equivalent to or before I draw what's equivalent to, let me say that your h here, h is exactly equal to h plus 1 minus 1. I think everybody will agree with that. 
h plus 1 minus 1. Now, if you remember from block diagram reduction, whenever you have something plus something, that's the same thing as having two elements in parallel. So I would say this is h um, minus 1 plus 1. Okay, h minus 1, I'll put in parentheses, not because it changes anything, but I'll put it in parentheses. Now I'm going to redraw this same diagram. I'm going to redraw this diagram, but now I'm now going to change my feedback elements. So my g element, I'll keep it, um, I'll keep my g elements. Now I will have an h minus 1, and then I will have another feedback element that makes this a unity feedback system. Um, so that's my C. So this comes in here and the output of this goes in there. Same way we had it before, negative. But now remember, this is H minus one. I now need to add one to it. So I'm going to place another feedback element with a um, unity transfer function in parallel with this. So it will have to have the same input and the same output. So now I have one more feedback loop, also negative feedback. So that now this is the same thing as saying this whole thing is negative feedback and this is H minus one plus one. So I've implemented this same circuit or this same system over here. Okay. Having implemented that same system over here, now that is equivalent to a unity um, feedback system that I can draw this way. Now I'm going to take a feedback or um, reduce these two together and keep my unity feedback. By the time I reduce this, remember what you have as reduction will be G over 1 plus G times the feedback element, or feedback transfer function, that's H minus 1. Okay, so this now is my, um, if you want, forward path again. And now I have a unity feedback system. So now I have my system in unity feedback. So if our system is not a unity feedback system, we can simply rep um, represent it in this form. And now we can just make use of our equation, taking this entire expression over here as G. So if we were to find the steady state error of this system over here, we will have our E of S being equal to the R of S, which is what we had over one plus it used to be G. Now what we have over here is this entire expression. In other words, G over 1 plus G into H minus 1. So for whatever system it is you have, you could just simply make use of this, um, this um, equation if you want, or this method that we've just come up with, and you can arrive at your steady state error. Arrive at this um, find the inverse Laplace transform, and then you find your time function of your um, error. But do we have to do that? Well, the answer is no, because if you remember, one of the um, um, one of the entries in our the Laplace transform table, in every Laplace transform table, is something that says that you could find a time signal, you could find the final value, it's called the final value theorem, okay? The final value theorem tells us that we can find the final value of a theorem. So if we want to find the, the, um, the error as time heads towards infinity, that is the same thing as finding the limit as S tends to zero of S multiplied by the Laplace transform of that particular times, time function. So the final value of the error or if you want your steady state error, is simply the limit as S tends towards zero of S multiplied by the um, Laplace transform of the error signal. So now we have another equation that we can work with. And for the rest of this discourse, I will make use of this unity feedback system we have been dealing with. In other words, G in the forward path. This, um, I'll, I'll leave this um, for now. So let's scroll down. If our... Okay, so if... Again, we're, for, this, for this, at this point, let me go ahead and redraw it here so that it's clear the system we are dealing with. Your R comes at the input. Your for, in the forward path, the plant's um, transfer function is G. The output is C, and we have unity feedback. So for this system, we already said we have an error signal there, and our E is given as 
um, r minus c. But that is also given as r over 1 plus g. So given this expression, then it means that our e, um, e infinity, that's our final error, or which we will now start calling our steady state error, ESS, that is simply equal to the limit as s tends towards zero of s multiplied by e of s. Now we know e of s is r over one plus g. So this is the limit as s tends towards zero of s multiplied by the error, which is s r over one plus g. And for all intents and purposes, this works for us. So we can use this expression at any point in time to determine the steady state error. One implication of this is let's we can look at different types of inputs. Okay, we can supply different types of inputs to this function to see what we get. So, say we want to find our steady state error given a step function. If our r of s, so let's say if r of s is equal to one over s, then let's find our steady state error. So, this sometimes you'll see people write this sometimes as e step infinity in other words the steady state error for a step function will be equal to the limit as s tends towards zero of s r of s over one plus g r of s is one over s so this is s times one over s divided by one plus g which is the limit as s tends towards zero of one over one plus g so this is our steady state error if our input is a step function. Okay, if our input is a step function, this will be the steady state error. Let's look at another scenario. Let's assume that our input is a ramp, a unit ramp. If it's a unit ramp, then the Laplace transform is one over s squared. Then e ramp of infinity will be equal to the limit as s tends towards zero of s multiplied by one over s squared over one plus g. This will be equal to the limit as s tends towards zero of one over s plus s g. Now, the if you try to find the limit of this as s tends towards zero, we can easily see that the limit of s as s tends towards zero will be zero. So this in all will give us the limit as s tends towards zero of one over s g. So if our input is a ramp, a unit ramp, the steady state error is 1 over SG. The limit as S tends to a 0 of 1 over SG. If the, unit, if the input is a unit step, the error, steady state error will be limit as S tends to a 0 of 1 over 1 plus G. Let's take the last, um, the last um, typical case we often think about, and that is if we had a parabolic input. So if we had a parabolic input, on the other hand, then say that's r of s is equal to 1 over s cubed, then our steady state error, just simply call it ESS, our steady state error will be the limit as s tends towards 0 of s multiplied by 1 over s cubed divided by 1 plus g. And I think it is clear that this will also come out to be like the ramp. This will come out to be 1 over s squared g. So we have this expression that we can simply make use of. Now, this is just, oh, we're doing all of this to just try to make our work relatively easy. So if we're given any particular system, if we're told that this is a unity feedback system and say, for example, your G of S, let's say we're given that the G of S is equal to 10 into S plus 20 into S plus 30 um, divided by say S squared, um, into s plus 25, um, into s plus 35, into, say, s plus 50. If we're given this system and we're told to find the steady state error, um, let's say we're told to find the steady state error using a number of different inputs. Let's say we're given that r of t, that's our input now, is equal to 15 u of t. If our input is 15 u of t, then we can find our steady state error, uh, um, well, let me just go ahead and find the time function. So our steady state error will be equal to the limit as s tends towards zero. We could do one of two things. We could just come ahead and use this formula, but 
I need to point out that this formula works for 1 over s. In this case, what we don't have is 1 over s. What we have is 15 over s. So just to make sure that things are clear, I will go ahead and walk from first principles. Or if you want, I'll go back and walk all the way from um, this expression over here. Limit as s tends to a 0 of sr over 1 plus g. If r of t is equal to um, 15 u of t, that means that r of s is equal to 15 over s. So this, well, this is the limit of s times 15 over s divided by 1 plus g. I'll simply leave it as g for now. Okay, I'll just simply leave that as g for now. Um, I should probably also, well, okay, I'll just let this be. Um, Okay, so let me let me let me let me not just let it be. So I'm going to move a bit to the right. I just write one more expression for each one of these terms. Uh, steady state error for a step input signal. We can as well write this as one over one plus the limit as s tends towards zero of g of s. I think this is clear because one is a constant. One is a constant. The only thing that will have it that will be dependent on s will be um, G. Okay, so we can simply write this expression in this form. In the same way, for the ramp input, we could write this as 1 over the limit as S tends towards 0 of S G of S. And um, for a parabolic input, we could write this as being equal to 1 over the limit as S tends towards 0 of S squared G of S. Okay, I just, it just occurred to me I didn't write that out earlier on, so I decided that we should write that. So, coming back here to this expression, S will cross out, and we're left with 15 over 1 plus G. So this is the limit as S tends towards 0 of 15 over 1 plus G. Now, I can rewrite this as 15 over 1 plus the limit as S tends towards 0 of g of s. I wrote it this way because I do not want to write out this g of s expression more than once, really. So let me go ahead and find this expression, and then I'll plug in the value in there. So the limit as s tends towards 0 of g of s, that will be equal to, as s tends towards 0, we can, more, we can just plug in the value of s as 0 in each one of these cases. So in my numerator, we'll have 10 multiplied by 20 multiplied by 30. In the denominator, we have 0 multiplied by 25 multiplied by 35 multiplied by 50. I think it's clear that the denominator here will be 0, so this gives us infinity. Okay, so this will give us infinity, 1 over 0, which is infinity, or undefined, depending on how you look at it. So, which that's equal to infinity. So, this expression over here will now be 15 over 1 plus infinity. 1 plus infinity is infinity. 15 over infinity, that gives us 0. So a steady state error for an input, for a um, step input, for a, uh, a, a step input of amplitude 15 will be 0. There will be no steady state error whatsoever. What if the, steady st what if the input had been different? What if we take the case where r of t is equal to 15 t... Um, yeah, let's make that a, let's go ahead and use a parabola directly. Say 15t squared u of t. So if this is what we had as our input, then our r of s will be equal to, um, I believe that will be 30 over s cubed, because take the Laplace transform of that, that'll be 2 divided by t, um, 2 divided by s cubed. Okay, so that'll be 30 over s cubed. So that is our input. Let's go ahead and plug that into our expression. So our steady state error, e of infinity, will be equal to the limit as s tends towards 0 of s multiplied by 30 over s cubed divided by 1 plus g. This simply gives us 30 over, I'll skip one step here, over the limit as s tends towards 0 of s squared g of s if you want. Okay, so this is now what we're going to need to find, this denominator. Once we can find the denominator, we have our solution. So we want to find the limit 
as s tends towards zero of s squared multiplied by g of s. I'll go ahead and rewrite this whole expression over here um, so that they answer since things are, I'm beginning to scroll off the page. Um, in our numerator, we had 10 s plus 20 s plus 30. So we have 10 into s plus 20 into s plus 30. In our denominator, we had s squared, but then we're multiplying this by s squared. So this s squared will cross out this s squared, and we're simply left with s plus 25, s plus 35, s plus 50 in the denominator. So s plus 25, s plus 35, s plus 50. Now we can come up with this expression by simply slot, um, substituting um, 0 for s. So that gives us 10 times 20 times 30 divided by 25 times 35 times 50. Okay, we could go ahead and do this computation and we arrive at some value. The specific value I will arrive at, okay, well, maybe I should try to do a bit of the computation, but then I don't think I'll run this all the way to the end because it's not really worth our time to um, find this full solution right now. Um, this is 125 multiplied by 35, and I'll just stop at this point. Point we get is that we have a finite value. Okay, so this will be a finite value. Um, I'll go ahead and plug this value back into this expression here. That gives me that my steady state error is equal to 30 um, multiplied by 35 multiplied by 125 divided by um, 600, I believe that is. So this will come out to be a specific number. And this number is not zero. This number is not infinite. So we get to see that for the same system, nothing has changed in the system. Nothing has changed in the arrangement. So nothing has changed in the system in, in all. Nothing has changed in the plants. Nothing has changed in the entire system. All we have done is change the inputs. For one type of inputs, a step function, we arrived at zero steady state error. But for another input, a parabolic function, we arrived at a finite steady state error. It is not zero. It is a finite value. And at this point, I can go ahead and tell you that if we had supplied a ramp instead, we would have also gotten a zero steady state error. And all that mattered really was that we changed the inputs. We changed the inputs. That's all we did. We changed the inputs. But is there a pattern? Yes, there is a pattern, okay? And that's what we now want to talk about. There is a pattern that apparently we can follow. Just by looking at the G of S, we could have determined what the steady state error will be for different types of inputs. So, given, once again, let me draw this out, given a unity feedback system that we're used to, any, any unity feedback system, okay, any unity negative feedback system that we use, say R, C, G, and our E, given this system, we can simply look at the G and what your G is will determine a lot um, what your steady state error will be. Now, let me to try to motivate that, come back to look at this G. In this G, what mattered was this term over here. The fact that we had an S squared term in the denominator. The number of poles that your plant has at the origin, that will determine um, what your steady state error system will look like. So the power of S over here, in this case, it is two. The power of S in this case is called the type of the system. It's called the system type, okay? So the type of the plant is dependent on the number of S's you have, a number of poles you have at the origin in the plant. Number of poles at the origin in the plant. So to try to motivate that a little bit, let's say we had a G of S, a G of S that looked something of this nature. Let's say we had a numerator, of s we had a denominator of s um let's just be a little consistent i'll write that as den of s and we had say s raised to power zero multiplied by this what is s raised to power zero s raised to power zero is one in other words we more or less do not have this term over here okay we really don't have this term. we just have a numerator and a denominator and let's say for in, in this scenario none of these other poles or zeros is at the origin. If this is the case, we'll call this a type zero system. Type zero because there is no 
pole at the origin. There is no pole at the origin. It's the type zero system. So I'll call this a type zero system. And I'll give one or two examples over here. So for example, one of our S plus one, S plus two, this is a type zero system. Also, we could have had a case where we had say S plus S plus three over S cubed plus two S squared plus seven S plus five. This will also call a type zero system. Type zero because there is no pole at the origin in my G of S. So let me write the G of S over here. Okay, no, I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep it where I kept it before. Okay, so because this there is no pole at the origin, this is a type zero system. Let's say on the other hand we had something like this: numerator of S over S multiplied by denominator of S. Then at this point, I think you know that I'm going to say that this is a type one system okay type one system because there is one pole at the origin examples of this could be three over s into s plus one this is a type one system s plus five over s into s squared plus um, eight s plus two this is also a type one system there is one pole at the origin in your g of s the final um, 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 class of system, the final type of system we often talk about are type two systems, and this is um, this. I think you already know means that you have two poles at the origin, so s squared times den of s. This is a type two system, and examples of this could be say something like um, eight over s squared into s plus one, or you have fifteen over s squared or you have say s plus 2 over s squared into s um, cubed plus 8 s squared plus 9 s plus 1 okay so these are type 2 systems okay these are type 2 systems and um, that is important these are type 2 systems I'll stop this video at this point, but in the next video, we'll now talk about type 1, type 0, type 1, and type 2 systems. How can we get the steady state errors without even doing any computation? Or how can we estimate what the steady state error will be without even doing any, any comp computation? This system here was a type 2 system, and so a step input gave us a 0 steady state error, and a parabolic input gave us a finite value as the steady state error. In the next video, we're going to formalize this concept. See you in the next one.